and welcome to Unparliamentary Language, and we're back for our second Silly Season special. Um, I like the alliteration there. Do you, Rob? I, I always love some alliteration, and I'm feeling very silly today, so let's let's do it. Uh, and speaking of being silly, what what is it we're discussing today that's so silly? <laughs> um, <laughs> the silly old history of the British Isles from 1945 to around about 1997, uh, trying to cover about 50 years of political, economic and social history all within an hour. So I will just apologise in advance if I have to use a broad brush when describing some things. We will have to skim over some of the detail about events that people have written entire books about, but I, I will try and do my best. I mean, I think that's fine. This is kind of an overview. Uh, it is actually at special request via our YouTube comments. Um, so it was, uh, I'm just finding the name of the person. Oh, hang on. This is uh, Abstract Scope, which I believe is our very listener who is in, in the um, in the chat. Ooh, I hadn't ooh. realized. Excellent. That's amazing. Well, um, well, welcome to your personalized podcast. Just yeah, it's you. almost like this is specifically for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, excellent. Yes, so, so we will press on then. Um, so I believe our first point was, War, huh? What is it good for? Uh, or more importantly, what was the impact of World War Two on Britain? Um, pretty bad, I think, would be the short summary. Um, but yeah, I mean, but we weren't completely wiped out, so that that helps. Um, uh, 1945. I, I I don't know how many people really know this. Like, it's something I didn't study at school, but I am aware of from Wikipedia. But we we won the war, and we almost immediately had an election in which Churchill lost. Um, what do you think were some of the reasons behind that? Um, well, it's a bit complex, and I understand that it sounds a bit crazy that you're like wartime leader. I think most people, when they think of Britain, might think of Churchill as one of the iconic leaders lost straight after the war. Um, one of the big reasons behind it was that during the war, we had a coalition government. So that was both Conservative and Labour in charge. Essentially, the Conservatives took charge of um, running the war and Labour took charge of running things on the home front. Um, so they nationalised um, sort of uh, industries at home to make sure they could create things for the war. Uh, and a lot of people at home thought that Labour had done a really good job of managing things within the country. Uh, now the war was over, you didn't need a wartime leader like Churchill. You needed somebody who could take care of the day-to-day -day business. And people thought that was Clement Attlee, uh, the Labour leader. Uh, they also sort of saw it as a, like a, a new dawn, the working man. Um, there'd been a there'd been a lot of class divide in Britain um, before the war, and during it, it'd been sort of a a leveler. It didn't matter if you were upper class. It didn't matter if you were a lord, or it didn't matter if you just grew up in a in a mining village. All of these people were affected by the war in the same way. They all had to sort of plug together for queen and for, for yeah, sorry, king and country. So that led to this sort of feeling that oh right, now's the 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 time of the working class we can sort of get rid of this it's our time to be in charge um also a along with this sort of feeling that it was labor's time uh, the conservatives actually ran quite a negative campaign against labor kind of warning of the dangers of socialism and that was a little bit weird if you think that this was in 1945 it was just before the cold war had begun russia was still our allies and russia was of course incredibly socialist. So to say that socialism was evil when we just won a war with Russia was sort of a bit of a, a juxtaposition that the British electorate didn't really believe when the Conservatives were trying to spout the dangers of it. Um, I think if the election had been held sort of five years later, when the Cold War was more in full swing, the result might have been different. But anyway, essentially, Labour won, and that gave them a mandate to extend those sort of policies that they've been putting into action in World War II and trying to make them work in a peacetime scenario. Uh, and I think there's two things I probably want to briefly mention, because as I say, I've been reading up on this fairly recently. I think one thing a lot of people, because uh, Churchill is best known for his role in the war, um, Churchill basically, he was a conservative and then he had, he had a period where he wasn't really affiliated with any particular party so he wasn't he wasn't liked necessarily by all of the conservative party um so that also probably didn't help him after neville chamberlain churchill kind of took over because they needed someone who was ready to go to war and 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 could handle that pressure and churchill had a lot of contact with the us and he was previously the first minister of defense i believe during uh, world war one um so like he, he was the right man for that job but not only was obviously Labour not a massive fan of him because he wasn't really in Labour, he was kind of either 
unaligned or a liberal at various points. And so the Conservatives weren't massively for him either. So while he was the right man for the job during the, the war years when there was a coalition between all of the government parties, it was also um, a fact that he wasn't super popular w within his own church, as it were. Another thing was Labour was relatively new. I think they'd only just, they'd won their first general election just before the war. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, they'd won it in the 19... 30s but it was sort of a it was yeah just just one government that was a minority government so they didn't actually have uh, a full charge of the commons as they would um so yeah this was their first big chance of ruling with with all the power as it were so following all of that um well <laughs> all of that so following <laughs> world war Two, um we've got this uh late labor win the election it's 1945 to 51 what i mean economically presumably we weren't doing very well we just spent all our money on a war um there was rationing uh, essentially, how how did that Labour government, um, traditionally seen as high on spending, how did they deal with that situation? Uh, well, they they called it an age of austerity, and essentially they kept the rationing in place after after the war, um, trying to phase it out when things became more available. Um, but they really they really struggled with the legacy of World War Two, the fact that the UK was effectively broke, um, and they didn't have much money to spend on. The basics. Um, we were really reliant on aid from both the US and Canada, who both provided us with loans. Uh, and then there's also a thing called the Marshall Plan, which was uh, very simply a, a gift from the US. It was a loan. It was, it was money that you didn't have to pay back. Um, and the Marshall Plan was a scheme put in place by the United States to sort of persuade Western European countries not to turn to communism uh, because there was a big fear after World War II and particularly the influence of Russia in Eastern Europe um, that many people would look to a communist regime to get them out of the troubles or the potential economic problems that they'd run into. Uh, so the US paid a massive sort of like payment out to the UK. Uh, I can't remember the exact figure off the top of my head, but I think it was in billions. Um, to make sure that the UK could sustain themselves during this time and not have to go to communism. So on top of this money that they've got, Labour also had a very sort of ideological commitment to nationalisation, uh, which we've already mentioned happened a lot during World War II. You had to nationalise steel industries to make sure they were providing stuff to the government so they could get it out in war. Um, Labour just extended that uh, to make sure that people still had jobs to go into after the war, that they didn't just disappear. Um, they also helped to run sort of national insurance schemes, um, which was essentially a new tax, which would help, help to pay for um, systems like pensions or health care, uh, which would be set up by the government and paid for, um, sorry, and run by the government. Uh, so the biggest policy that was done at this time was the NHS. It was born um, in this age of austerity to make sure that everybody in the country could be protected, could have access to health care. Um, and well, they sort of saw it as a smart economic investment at the time as well, because it meant more people keep on working. It would increase the standard of living, um, all of that kind of jazz. Uh, this all ties into an idea uh, of economics at the time, which was called Keynesian economics, because uh, it came from the, it was, it was the idea of uh, an economist called Keynes. I will preface this by saying I'm, I'm not an economist, so this is a very layman's description of how Keynesian economics works. Um, but essentially, his policy was that when the market crashes, uh, the capitalist system, just in general, if you leave it to free market forces, it doesn't provide for those who need it the most. It tends to make the poorest unemployed. Um, and also by doing that, by creating more unemployment, um, there's little demand for other goods and services. Uh, and you get into an economic downward spiral that you can't get out of as demand decreases, then more people have to become unemployed. And then that just keeps going on and on and on. Um, so the Keynesian economic system essentially creates demand and gives employment through government managed schemes. So, for example, if we go and build a hospital now that will both employ people at the moment, it will make sure that people have a long term, healthier life. And that will make sure that we can then have a stronger economy in the future. And hopefully, fingers crossed, the global economy would have recovered by the time that hospitals finished. Um, or at least the demand we've created will have helped the economy recover to the extent um, that we can afford this hospital. Um, I think for our US listeners, the best comparison is FDR's New Deal policies, which was essentially when he 
took on some government schemes to employ people um, in the 1930s to help with the Great Recession there. Uh, so that was the economic that was the economic way that they they managed it. Um, it's how, even though they had so little money, they were you could say um, that they were wise in their investments for at least building for the future to make sure that they didn't return to a recession that very easily could have happened after World War Two. Okay, so. I mean, obviously, obviously it worked to an extent because everything's fine now. But um, <laughs> um, well, I mean, I say fine. But you, you know what I mean? Like, fine now. So, but bold... Everything is fine. Everything <laughs> is fine. It's a very bold statement in, a, in post-Brexit Britain. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, um, I mean, so it sounds like from an economic point of view, with the help of the US, because um, the US basically had uh, kind of helped improve its station during both world wars because it hadn't while it had been involved being an ocean away meant that it could kind of build up uh its industry uh with both wars um without really losing it uh, you know out losing out financially so that's the thing that's why both times the u.s ended up uh as you say paying these loans and everything yeah. Um, it, it, it also didn't have essentially the, the structural damage of any of the European nations. They didn't have to rebuild roads. You know, you know, half of London was, you know, the, the amount of London that was destroyed in the Blitz was massive. And that's a huge economic cost. Um, but the US didn't have to do that. So, um, yeah. So, so thanks to the US uh, and and some of these policies, it, it sounds like the economics was actually, I, I, I always feel like I'm surprised how quickly we sorted everything out. I mean, obviously there was never going to be a switch you know it wasn't going to be suddenly 1945 uh, rationing is over but it, it's impressive how quickly we recovered and as you say things were brought back in as and when they were more available so i i feel like well, obviously we weren't around at the time but i feel like that that helps uh people's perception that things are improving if they're slowly getting things like back so at the same time do we want to touch on the the how foreign policy was affected i mean the war had just ended germany was literally split in two but what was kind of going on in that period straight after the war uh, so, yeah, you've got the UK was aligned with the US and France after World War Two, essentially because they were the main powers in Western Europe and um, the Soviets had greater power in Eastern Europe. As we've already said, the, the UK is sort of reliant on US money, which immediately makes it more aligned with the US than it would be with Russia. But also there are sort of greater sort of political and, and, and cultural ties there anyway. Um, the biggest problem was, though, in, in the UK sense, was that the UK was seen as sort of a minor player in this new Cold War that was developing. And mm. if you look at it, just after 1945, um, there was the Potsdam Conference, uh, which was between the big three leaders of the USA, UK and the Soviet Union. Um, Stalin was... <laughs> Stalin was the only one that had remained from the previous Yalta conference that happened in 1944. Um, Truman had taken over from FDR, but was still seen as a relatively big player. And Attlee, hardly, Truman and Stalin hardly knew who he was. And he was seen as a less serious figure in foreign policy because he hadn't been dealing with that side of things during World War II. Also for the UK, there's a problem with empire. So um, we slowly at one stage um under the victorians uh we probably could lay claim to roughly a third of the globe that had started to slip away after world war one and after world war two it became even harder for the uk to justify having an empire abroad uh, essentially you've just fought a, a war with ideals from you know breaking away from um, oppressors and a more liberal idea of how you can run yourself and, and be more of a democracy that seemed at odds with the UK's idea of, of, of empire. As I say, essentially, Hitler wants an empire, that's bad. Oh, we have an empire. What's that? What are, that's like you're hiding behind your back, Britain. Oh, it's uh, the Falkland Islands and a number <laughs> of other countries. Um, yes. yes. <laughs> so so there's there's that. Um, and one of the, the jewel in the crown, as it was called, um, India, uh, eventually broke away at this time. Um, it was also really hard for the UK to police an empire as well. It would be really costly to send the UK forces abroad to police anything like that. Um, and there was no sort of desire back at, back at home to do that either. You'd just come out of a, of a gruelling war. The last thing you wanted to do was suddenly start a fight halfway across the world to try and keep control of a, of a colony you control for ages. So uh, in very layman's terms, that's why the empire started to, to slip away. Uh, and India was probably the which happened during at this time was probably the, the biggest and most significant example of um, a very powerful nation deciding to make itself separate from the UK and become independent. I mean, it probably the biggest 
biggest member of the empire by population, I would assume. Uh, even then. Yes. Yeah, yeah, by far. All right, so we had uh, Labour from 45 to 51. Mm-hmm. And then we have another uh, general election, right, after six years, which is a bit longer than normal. But then we'd had 10 years of kind of not really a, gov- a normal government during the World War period. So, well, sorry, 10 years without a general election during yeah, the World so, War period. Sorry, so, they, they, they did have an election in 1950. Um, which oh, Labour it was in 1950. Won. Okay. Uh, no, Labour won one in 1950, but they called another one in 1951, essentially because there was a there was a split in the Labour Party and that they forced ah, an election. I see. I was, I was wondering if that was a, a choice, because if so, it seems like an odd one since they then lost. Yeah. But right, okay, that makes sense. So the party split, is that when we had the formation of the Lib Dems or is that later on? That's later on. I mean, yeah, that, that's way later on the Lib Dems. We'll, we'll come to that when we come to that. Right, okay. That's fine. I, I didn't know. I know it's a split in the Labour Party that led to that and I didn't know if it was then or, or later on. They have another election after five years. Mm-hmm. They win. Then there's a split in 1951. And so we have another general election. And un, probably unsurprisingly, if there's a big split in the party, the Conservatives come back in, into power. What does that period of time look like? Um so essentially, the the big point I want to draw from this is that the Conservatives were back in power, but and and they they'd run an election essentially again saying that we're a united party, which which helps to run a country. Um, they'd also sort of criticise some of the austerity politics that were put in by Labour, despite the fact that you know rationing was slowly ending. It was still a bit of a grind after the war of people thinking this should be over now after five years. We should start to be spending a bit more. So the Conservatives lent on that to help them them win um but crucially they although they said they wouldn't extend nationalization um they didn't repeal any nationalization either so massive things that have come in like the nhs like national insurance um they kept and they decided that this was the new normal uh i think even even nowadays you'd say it was hard that any politician could could win in the uk saying that they would abolish the nhs it seems like a ludicrous thing to say after we've had it for so long. Um, but they'd only had the NHS for five years, and, th- and there was a for six years then really. Um, and there was a the, the Conservatives could have, if they'd chosen, try and repeal that system. But it seems so popular that they chose not to. And you get an age of consensus politics from this point, where the new normal is that we have a level of social security that there is. We do pay national insurance to help fund healthcare, education, other things like that, um, and that the NHS would exist. So that's sort of the the big political swing. Um, just to go through some of like the key political points, um, Churchill took back power, but he's sort of seen as old and ailing and not quite with it. Um, if you, I would recommend watching The Crown. Have you seen any of mm. that? I haven't. It's on my to watch list. Um... Yeah, um, that does a really good job. Uh, actually, I mean, it's it's dramatised in some ways, but it does a good way of showing you what the political situation was at the time in in, in Britain. Um, he's a Churchill who's not quite the same as he was before the war. He's a he's a figurehead for the party, but all the strings are actually being pulled by uh, Anthony Eden, who's a foreign secretary and seen as very charismatic in the party. And when Churchill eventually decides to stand down, Eden comes to the front. And during this that period, I mean, Churchill is quite ill. He he took over during world war ii and he was already in his 60s and i believe i'm not sure if it was at exactly at that time but at least by the time he died he'd had 10 strokes um so you know he he was not well during that period of time yeah they've got so that happens and eden takes over um the big thing i want to focus on here really is the foreign policy uh situation with the uk mm-hmm. so we've already said how the uk is sort of seen as a an ailing power um compared to the us and russia um, what happens under Eden is something called the Suez Crisis, uh, which is essentially uh, NASA, who was in charge of Egypt at the time, decided to take over um, a key canal that was used for trade, the Suez Canal, um, and this went against a previous peace treaty. Uh, the UK thought this was a big breach and they wanted to send forces to the region. The US didn't want to. They thought it would be essentially too destabilizing um, to the region and it might force Egypt closer to the Soviet Union. Eden ignores this and goes to war without the consensus of the UN or anything like that. He goes to war essentially almost in secret with French and Israeli forces. And although they get a military victory, the invasion is seen as quite unpopular in the wider international world. Um, It's almost seen as not justified. Um, If you put this in context, they just had the Korean War uh, in 1950, and that was one of the first wars that the UN all came together and said, yes, we've 
we decide will be on this side and we'll fight for them and this will be a huge international fighting force between a coalition of different countries. This was really different. This seemed like old-fashioned foreign policy. And ultimately, the US threatened to withdraw funds from the UK if they kept up trying to keep a military presence in this canal. And eventually, the presence was seen as too expensive to the UK. They couldn't justify uh, keeping something there. And they had to withdraw. And after that, as a result, um, Eden resigned. Uh, that was partly due to his own ill health as well. But Suez was certainly seen as a massive embarrassment for the UK. It was it was so embarrassing because it showed that the UK couldn't act independently anymore. They couldn't just pick a war and fight it by themselves and, and, and move on as they had essentially before when they had control of the empire. They were now really reliant on partners, particularly the US, to provide funding for it. If you can't do that by yourself, you're not a superpower. The US could sustain a war by itself. The Soviets could do the same. The UK couldn't. And with the end of that superpower status, the UK is sort of relegated um, to a position that it's sort of held to this day as a as a coalition partner with the US. Um, so lot, a fair amount of soft power, but not so much military power, etc. Correct. Yeah. So following that, well, we've just lost uh, Anthony Eden, as you say. Do we do we have a sudden like turnover of conservative leaders? Do we fight for someone to take over for a short bit? Or I know we move into Labour in sixty four. So, so we have uh, Harold Macmillan, yep. um, as a conservative leader who takes over pretty swiftly after, and the Conservatives, like you say, keep power from nineteen sixty four. So although it was a crisis for the UK in general, it wasn't really a crisis for the Conservatives. And they kept it going. One of the big reasons for this um, was that from the 1950s to about 1969, it's seen as a massive period of relative economic prosperity. So we've already talked about the age of austerity from 45 to 50. Now, in this golden age, uh, the main reason people started to feel good was that unemployment was extraordinarily low at this time, being about 1.9%. The reasons for this was because, uh, well, that you've got an economy that's mostly nationalised, so the government can guarantee employment for a large percentage of the population. Uh, this increases demand, which makes other industries more viable. Um, so it really, that government managed economy really is focused on making sure people are employed. UK economy is also starting to sort of modernise a little and move away from manufacturing. And, and as a result of that, you see the sort of growth of a middle class as people don't have to work in the factories all the time. They've got a bit of insurance. They've got a healthcare system that keeps that allows them to, you know, take some time off, but they don't have to work themselves. Uh, almost well, like if you look at the Victorian times, they were working themselves to death. This is like a long time on from that, but they're not having to work to the same extent that they would before the war. Um, they have more time for leisure activities, which of course means more growth in those sort of industries. Um, Rationing came to an end, so people felt freer. Um, and Macmillan said in 1957, uh, quite a famous speech, uh, that he said, you've never had it so good. And essentially the British public agreed um, that this was one of the best times to be alive in, in the UK, particularly if you're thinking that it's 12 years after w World War II, people suddenly felt in a relatively short period of time that their lives had got markedly better. So, so this is kind of reflected in a similar way to stuff you would see if you're a US listener. This is that time where you see, you know, it's, it's rock music starting up um, and you have people going on caravan holidays in the UK. We have things like Butlins taking off. As I say, it's growth of tourism, a growth of that kind of free time that is often kind of immortalized in postcards, I think. Uh, very, very much, you know, you, I feel like when you watch any documentary from that period, it's a lot of people walking around in swimsuits enjoying themselves. Uh, <laughs> but in fact, Britain is never really that sunny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was... Um... I, I think also if you think of like uh, just pop culture as well, you mentioned like pop music. Uh, the Beatles in the 1960s kind of helped to add to that swinging 60s vibe. Um, England also won the World Cup in 1966. Not that we go on about it a lot. I mean, all, all the time because we've not won anything <laughs> properly since. <laughs> but yeah, um, and even uh, so Wilson, who was Labour leader from 64 to 1970, uh, took advantage of the World Cup win, essentially called a called an election rather soon after that World Cup win to sort of capitalise on a on a feeling of a national high that yes we're doing well Britain's doing well why don't you vote for the same government again um, to make us look good so yeah I haven't got much more to say on sort of the fifties and sixties because essentially that's a, a very potted overview of of Britain seen on the up and up they feel like they're doing well and as a result the politics is relatively stable as i mentioned you had that 
that consensus politics, the economic and, and foreign policy isn't really changing that much between the two parties. They might differ ideologically on a couple of points, but the core direction of the UK is is in the same direction from the 1950s to uh, the end of the 1960s. Um, before we move on to the 70s, I'm just going to drop in a point here. So 1968, um, there was uh, equal rights for equal pay uh, going on um, in Dagenham at the Ford factory. And this was turned into a movie in 2010 and then later a musical. And I think it's interesting because it is rare, I think, to have a kind of pop cult. I mean, so Churchill famous, like, you know, Churchill's appeared in Doctor Who with an, on an episode in World War II with the Daleks. Um, but after that, a lot of these prime ministers, people don't really know because unless they turned up as a spitting image puppet, and even then, listeners any younger than us didn't really see spitting image. Uh, I saw a tiny bit of spitting image as a child. It wasn't really on when I was kind of properly growing up. There's, there's not really, I don't think there's this sense of what those kind of prime ministers were like. I feel like, I mean, unless you've studied them directly, I don't think we have this kind of impression of them like we do of Thatcher and other people will get to. So it's interesting. Uh, I would recommend, I'll put it in the show notes, the song Always a Problem, uh, which is supposed to be, it, obviously it's a fictionalised version of it, but it's supposed to be uh, Wilson's response to finding out that there's these women striking at this um, factory over equal pay. And it's him. And uh, it's a very good musical. I would definitely recommend it, having been in it myself. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it, it's got a good message and a lot of good songs. Um, but that particular one is quite good. And there's a, it, yeah, I mean, the, the song is always a problem waiting in the wings. Um, you know, it's it's like how, oh, you know, everything we think is going well and there's still a problem for the prime minister, you know. So uh, that's a good song I would just recommend there as a slight aside before we move on to the 1970s. Cool. Um, yeah, just just to add a slight point to you, what you said about not knowing what what prime ministers were like. Um, Wilson was one of the first um, to take advantage of TV that was just mm. starting to come into campaigning. And I think if you look up clips on on YouTube, there are some that exist, um, or have a look at pictures. He's always sort of pictured with a with a pipe that he literally just had for his sort of TV appearances to make him look more in in touch with the working man. That was the thought that if I have a pipe and I puff on it occasion that's that's what the work the working man will agree that i am i am his man and a man of the people in that sense um so weird little things like that early early campaign tricks were, were starting to come in so yeah i'd, I'd recommend youtube and just googling the party political broadcast so we're going to move on to the 1970s which you've subtitled the end of the golden age so this is so wilson goes away heath uh which was he conservative again Heath's conservative yeah so 1970, we have Heath for four years. Uh, how, how is the conservative, uh, sorry, how is the economic situation changing? We've had, we've had this kind of boom uh, through the, the 60s and, well, boom tends to be followed by bust. Uh, what, what went wrong in the early 70s? So one of the big problems is, ascent, is there are a couple of short term things that we'll go into. Um, so in 1974, you have uh, an oil crisis, and I know this affected the US as well, uh, but it affected the UK quite badly as well and led to something we call a three-day week. Uh, so essentially, there was only enough energy to power factories for three days instead of five. Um, and that happened under Conservative government, and that that shook British confidence quite a bit. Um, if you are unable to sustain production for five days and only three, that really shows that your your economic system isn't isn't working. Um, we also had in 1979 something called the winter of discontent, uh, which arose when workers went on strike in a number of key industries. Uh, most notable of these being bin men. Uh, so there were pictures of rubbish piling up on the street that was left there for for months as bin men basically refused to go and pick it up. It shows sort of a real a real contrast between that and the and the 60s that had been so promising to. People having to, you know, in the three day week, have evenings by candlelight as the there wasn't enough energy to keep the lights on. And then in 1979, with even the most basic services not being available. So the reasons for this are more long term and many blamed the Keynesian economics that had first led to prosperity uh, were now having the opposite effect. The main problems were so excessive trade union power. People uh, being in nationalized industries had had a lot of had joined trade unions, which were used as a force to sort of promote fairer pay for workers, better better conditions. All sounds good on, on the surface, but the problem is that when 
when the economy started going into recession, the unions still had could put pressure on the workers to raise wages when maybe it wasn't the best economic decision. Some businesses may have liked to have made some people redundant in order to keep the factory open. The fact that they couldn't do that or the fact that they risked upsetting the unions and then that might force them to stop production altogether meant that there was sort of a, a slow decline in how much industries could produce. And they were sort of, well, the, the argument from the right wing and um, from the right would be that the unions having too much power stopped businesses having the flexibility to hire and fire and adjust wages in, in line with what the demand was at the time. This was also matched by sort of too much nationalisation. So the government having control over things meant, again, they were less flexible about how they could conduct business. This sort of very rigid economic policy led to them maybe creating artificial demand that the economy just couldn't sustain. We, we've talked about Keynesianism creating artificial demand that's, that's good at the start, but if you keep on creating that artificial demand and the economy doesn't catch up with you, if it never recovers, then you just can't sustain that. And that's what appeared to be happening through the 1970s. Those on the right might also blame uh, insufficient entrepreneurship. So essentially, if you have a lot of government controlled businesses, that leads people to sort of not be very entrepreneurial or they're not encouraged to set up their own businesses that might find a gap in the market because they have the sort of the guarantee of work under the government. And, and all of this sort of builds together to create a, an economic system that feels, uh, that feels locked in. The, both, both sides of the government still agree that Keynesian economics is the way to, to run things. But neither of them can really get a handle on it or, or make it work with them sort of nudging the needle ever so slightly to the left or, 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 or to, the, to the right. It, it's striking at this time that the governments of Heath from 1970 to 74, Wilson and, and Callaghan, were governments that had really, really tiny majorities in Parliament. Or in the case of Wilson, they were actually a, a minority government. So that means they were the largest party in the House of Commons but all the other parties could theoretically outvote them. Um, so it leads the, the leads of politicians are having very little power to, to change much because the slightest hint of doing anything too radical would lead to a rebellion and then losing power. End of the 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, some lots of minority governments back and forth. Mm -hmm. And the country wants change. Uh, they've had enough of this consensus uh, on Keynesian economics. They've decided that's not working. So we need a change in financial policy, maybe less nationalisation. We're going to shake it up. And that leads to a very long period of uh, conservative government, starting with, well, Thatcher in 1979 comes to power, our first female prime minister, um, conservative prime minister. And what, what was her financial policy? What was it that swung the election in, in her favour from Labour, other than the fact that Labour had been in power for five years at that point? So you often swing back and forth. Yeah, essentially, she offered a an alternative approach, breaking away from the Keynesian economics. Um, it was to take government out of the economy and rely on market forces and, and free trade. And this would lead to higher unemployment in the short term, but it was hoped that it would help increase growth over the long term, which would which would help which would help the economy recover um, from. The recession that it was falling into. She also said that she would remove some power from the unions, uh, which had started to become quite unpopular, particularly with things like the winter of discontent. Uh, if there are too many strikes or they start affecting public services to the point that they don't work anymore, um, strikes in the unions tend to become less popular than they once were. So that just starts out with this policy. Um, and initially, it didn't work. So Britain was seen to be falling into a recession. Uh, however, she had a slight saving grace, um, or at least in, in her opinion it was. Um, we went to war with Argentina over the Falkland. I won't go into much detail now, um, but essentially it was a very small island um, off the coast of South America that Britain had claimed to, but Argentina also had some claim. Argentinian forces in, invaded it and the UK went out to defend it. Uh, when the UK won, it was seen as sort of a big rally round the flag event for the UK. There was a lot of sort of pride that we'd been able to to win that war. Um, and because Thatcher was seen as somebody who, who wasn't afraid to go to war, who wasn't afraid to fight for a British colony that apparently had been um, attacked sort of like without provocation, that led her to sort of like a, a big popularity boost. Um, and when she went into the election in 1983, she had quite a big advantage. Mm. We've also talked about how 
We talked about possible splits with Labour before. In 1983, this is where we get the big split in the Labour Party. So was this before or after the election, just from a timeline perspective? It, it, so it's before. So, so just before the election. OK. So so before the election, or essentially since ni- since Thatcher won in 1979, the Labour Party was the Labour Party leader was Michael Foot, who was hmm. seen as quite um, representing the the radical left of the party. Um, the biggest problems that sort of that made people disagree with Foot was not only that he was so left wing, but also because he committed the Labour Party to a policy of um, denuclearization, so a ban on nuclear weapons. And it is the height of the Cold War. So yes, yeah, yeah, height of the Cold War. So certainly popular amongst a you know a quite passionate proportion of the population, but sort of nationally it was seen as a fairly unpopular policy. Uh, so that led some Labour MPs to split and form a new party called the SDP, the Social Democrats. Um, and Labour went into the 1983 election with a traditional Labour Party, the SDP in the middle and the Conservatives, um, who had just won the Falklands War, at least in, in the public's eyes, Thatcher was, had been seen responsible for that event. So the result was an absolute landslide to Thatcher. Um, Labour picked up seats in their heartlands, but were um, you know, pretty much wiped out everywhere else, and the Social Democratic Party flopped. Uh, they picked up quite a large percentage of the vote, but because of our first past the post system, which we will go into in later episodes, um, essentially picked up a handful of seats. Uh, so they ended up merging with the Liberals, and that's where you get the creation of the Liberal Democrats as we know them today. Uh, so I know you mentioned before when they've been formed, the mid 1980s, you get the Lib Dems as they are now. With this result, Thatcher finally had the big parliamentary majority, which meant she could really enforce all of her policies with the opposition party unable to stop most things. And this is where you get the big changes. So we've talked about giving nationalisation, like ending nationalisation or reversing it. Um, Big industries like uh, British Gas and uh, British Telecom, which were formerly nationalised industries, were made, were put into the free market. You had stocks and shares public could now own them in a different way and they were forced to compete against other energy companies and other telephone companies so that's why we still have those big that, that's why we still have bt it's still called bt it's still british telecom because it was once nationalized and is no longer she also took on the unions uh, so you've got the miners strike in 84 85 continuing our political uh, musicals theme uh, that's <laughs> uh, i believe that's where billy elliot is set during that that strike <laughs> yeah um, and also, um, oh, have you seen Pride at all? I haven't. I've heard good things, but I haven't watched it yet. Is that the, that's the uh, one set in Wales, right? Uh, yeah, Pride's excellent. Um, that's actually miles up like a, the, the social events of the time from the LGBT community teaming up with miners striking to get both of their causes recognised. Um, so anyway, that's a bit of an aside. Um, oh, yes, definitely. I appreciate. <laughs> but, you know, for those following along at home, they now have two musicals to go watch. Yes. <laughs> So she took on the unions, and although the miners striked for almost over a year, um, essentially they had to give in, they had to call off the strike so they could feed their families. And although it was done at an extreme human cost, Thatcher broke the back of the unions and reduced their political power immensely. So with government now encouraging um, industries to break free from nationalisation, without the union power, the economy recovered. Um, Unemployment still stayed relatively high it tended to be a system that benefited the rich more than the poor but it led to economic growth so this sort of continued period of economic growth meant that the conservatives just kept on winning and winning and winning and thatcher that's that's how thatcher stayed in power for 11 years essentially by creating a a strong economy that a large proportion of the electorate were happy enough with that they'd keep on voting conservative obviously the legacy of her time in power affected my childhood but you know, it's it's not like I have uh, contemporaneous uh, thoughts about um, Thatcher, um, but I, I get the impression she kind of splits the country. I think probably based on your political leaning in general, like she is generally seen as a a, a important figure in the Conservative Party. Um, people who support Labour tend not to like her, uh, as you say. There, there's this kind of, the, the miners' strike is probably a good example of that, where people who are anti-union are probably quite pleased with the result, whereas people who are pro-union and, and, and pro the miners would be sad with what happened especially since it's so protracted and i imagine well i mean I, i'm pretty certain people in those communities you know still harbor resentment because we saw some 
uh, we saw a, a lot of ding dong, the witch is dead stuff going on when Thatcher um, passed away. And uh, I think that's very much coming from those kind of communities who, you know, saw her as this this uh, evil figure. What was it who, that essentially led to her demise? Because so we had, as you say, there was economic growth, but then we have Black Monday in 1987 when the stock market crashes. Um, and we also have the poll tax, which all I know about it, it was, it was very unpopular. So do you want to fill me in a bit on those? Yeah, so I know with the the poll tax in particular. So the way that the way taxation usually worked is that you have a staggered tax system. So the poorest pay a very low rate of tax, and the richest pay the highest rate of tax because they're the ones who can afford to bear the greatest burden. Thatcher, with the poll tax, stopped that for a while, basically saying that everyone should pay the same fee for their local council. So if you're rich or poor, exactly the same. What this happened is that. Rich people were very, very happy as they had to pay far less, but the poor were very, very angry that they had to pay exactly the same as the rich, which is a big chunk of their income. And it and it led to riots. You get the poll tax riots in, in poor areas of the country. And this was such bad publicity for the Conservatives and even ideologically for a lot of people in, in her party. It was seen as a step too far. It was something that just wouldn't be accepted in British politics. Uh, and with that, there was a, a vote of no confidence in Thatcher. And she did win the first round, but decided that so many people had voted against her within her party that it probably wasn't right for her to continue. Uh, and that led to her stepping down in 1990. So just to be clear, the poll tax was, um, I've gotten the notes, it's the same flat rate. I'm not yeah. sure I 100% understood you. Is it Was it that everyone paid exactly the same amount, i.e. £500, whatever it was, or was it that everyone paid exactly the same percent of their salary? Everybody paid, everybody paid exactly the same amount. Okay. So five, so, 500 pounds. So if you're poor, that's, that's, that's obviously a massive burden. And, and if you're rich, it, it barely registers. Yes. Okay. Uh, do we have any idea what that was in, in, in real money today? Because I think that would be quite interesting to look at. No idea. Let's have a look. I'm just looking it up. <laughs> um, okay. So I can't find... I can't find Wikipedia article or anything on this, um, but I have found some forum posts that I will link to when I read through to determine how, how reliable they think they are. But they suggest it was £150 each in 19... Was it 1984? That would have been before they were brought in. I think the poll tax was brought in 1989. Okay, so £150 in 1989 today. Well, that would have been uh, about £350 in 2017 because the obviously the uh, inflation calculator doesn't take into account this year because we haven't finished it yet and i'm assuming that's like per month believe so yeah i'm not confident enough to say with any authority i don't know but if, if it's per month for council tax that that seems pretty high because that would be more than my council tax is now um I, yeah by a considerable margin it would be almost double what i'm currently paying in council tax because our council tax is based on the banding of the house um so yeah, if, if you were doing it per person, like the three of us living in this flat would be paying, oh, we'd be paying three times that amount because that's per head. That's great. Yeah, that, that, that is a crazy amount of money when you work it out. So I think that would be... Essentially, before then, local governments had been funded by, it, it was levied on houses rather than people. So the value of your house was how much you paid rather than, than people. So it was seen as um, unfair from the rich because they would have bigger houses and, and poor people would not have so nice houses. So there would be a difference in rates. So there was the proposed rate was a per head charge that saw every adult pay a fixed rate amount set by their lo local authority. And it proved extremely unpopular because you had some large families occupying relatively small houses that saw charges go up considerably um, compared to rich people who are living in like you could have two people living in a mansion and they'd pay less than for adults living in a council flat. Um, so that's essentially why it became so unpopular and led to riots, particularly in poorer areas. I, I can't be 100% certain. I've used the inflation calculator, I've made some assumptions, and I've looked up a figure that may be dubious on the internet. <laughs> as far as I can tell, the council tax for the house I'm in now, with three people living in it, would be based on £150 per head in 1989, would be £12,772 a year, if we're understanding that it's 150 a month. Yeah. Directly, which is insane, because that's like... It's like 1,200 a year or something here. 1,300. So that's like 10 times what our council tax is. And presumably they're also still taxed on their, their income. So that's just like an insane rise for people 
I, I, you know, we're we're not we're not we're not poor, right? <laughs> so we 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 should be able to take that based on the the idea behind the calculation. But we totally couldn't. Like none of us would be able to pay that suddenly if it was such a sudden change. So yeah, that's that's pretty crazy. So nineteen ninety, uh, she leaves. Um, I will put in the spitting image uh, go now link uh, that everyone uses when we talk and they talk about Thatcher leaving at that point in time. Um, which I think I think at that point most people. Maybe I'm wrong because I wasn't a lot, um, wasn't you know at least conscious at that time as a, as a tiny baby. I, I get the impression most people had had enough of her at that point. It wasn't just the problems within the Conservative Party. Um, it was you know Labour supporters were already against her, and then as you say, the poll tax made her unpopular even within her own party. So I think people were quite happy to see her go at that point. And we then got John Major, who I think is the first uh, Prime Minister I actually remember. Came, John Major came in in 1990, but there's a general election in 1992. Um, so in 1992, you've now had how many years of Conservative government? 13 years yeah. of Conservative government. Um, a very unpopular PM in, 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 Th- in Thatcher, who's just left, or she left being very unpopular. Everybody expected Labour to go and win. And what happened was that unexpectedly, John Major won with a majority, a, a, a relatively sizable majority for what people were expecting, uh, and it really shocked people within the Labour Party that they'd been able to lose from such a position of perceived strength. The reason, or at least some of the reasons that they looked for within their own party, was that they had too many old socialist policies that the electorate wasn't quite ready to to commit to. So they'd seen a fair bit of growth under Thatcher's um, free market policies, and to tempt those in the in the centre ground to go and vote for Labour was going to have to take quite a big shift. So in comes Tony Blair, uh, who essentially leads to a new form of consensus politics with his third way, where he marries up some of the economics of Thatcherism with the social ideals of Labour uh, and calls it a, a third way. Uh, so essentially his idea was to take the best economic parts of Thatcherism but make sure they had a kinder side to them that they wouldn't that the that the economic growth would then be used to fund services for the poor. A very broad brush, but that's essentially what the third way is. One of the biggest ideological commitments he made at the time um, was abandoning clause four. So Labour had a constitution, and clause four essentially committed it to the nationalisation of industries. By Labour abandoning that, that was essentially a symbolic change that suggested that Labour accepted that nationalisation wasn't always the right thing to do and that accepted that free market economics could have a benefit when used correctly. And the result of that essentially was that as the Conservatives uh, clung to power over the 1990s, they had a few uh, economic disasters such as... So yeah, so so Black Wednesday happened pretty soon after Major had, had won the general election. The UK was forced to withdraw from the European exchange rate mechanism, um, which was essentially a mechanism that was tried to keep the pound um, within a certain limit um, so it could match up with the rest of Europe. Um, It couldn't do this, and it saw a big crash in the value of the pound, and people blamed the government for mismanaging the situation um, and committing to certain European um, policies to do this. Um, All I was going to say is that matched with Labour's sort of commitment to an economic policy that now the more of the company, more of the country was comfortable with, led to a landslide victory for Labour in 1997. Uh, and you've sort of seen over this 50-year time period a change from consensus policies of nationalisation is is good to essentially nationalisation is bad. Uh, the government should now have less control of the economy. And you may argue, um, as we alluded to earlier in the podcast, that maybe the needle is swinging back the other way. We've had consensus policies from 1979 all the way to 2018. If the next general election was to go the way of Jeremy Corbyn, I think that would mark quite a big shift back towards that nationalisation idea, or at least a big split in the consensus that free market is always is always right. I mean, again, I'm trying to be conscious of my social media bubble, but there are that definitely I feel like people our age are kind of like who didn't necessarily have nationalization during our childhood anymore at all. I, I think there is a tendency for people our age to be going, oh, that looks like a good idea. Um, and there's still, uh, but then there's people older than us who are kind of warning, no, you didn't live through nationalization. But as we mentioned briefly earlier, how 
you know, c- could we reimagine nationalisation from the way it was done in the 70s in a different way? Would that be different? Um, and how would that work? Uh, it's not something we can answer here at the end of the podcast. It's not something I think I have enough information to answer right now, but I definitely get the feeling that people are more people are pro nationalization than they were um before then excellent um is there anything else you want to add uh, before we finish up no that's it that's <laughs> that's 50 years of british history done in, in a <laughs> nutshell <laughs> i feel like i've had everything to say there's there's way more uh, there's way more depth to have um i think a good series to watch if you can find it on youtube or anything like that is andrew marr did a brilliant history of britain series a few years back um that's a really excellent um you know overview of that time from about post-war to blair um so if you want to go and explore that in more depth I- i'd recommend that excellent so i mean i think we'd like to thank our listeners who have been here uh live during the recording um you can join us on discord there'll be a link in the show notes uh if you want to listen to us recording we do try and record every other week on a sunday but it's not always on a sunday but we post that in the discord server um and uh we will yeah um as always you can find us at parliamentary.observer you can find us at reddit forward slash r forward slash unparliamentary you can search for unparliamentary language on facebook and you can find us on twitter at unparl podcast and of course our, our usual plug that if you go to patreon.com forward slash ttss you can throw some money our way which obviously it, it sh- you know shows us what's doing the podcast but also helps um uh helps us buy a new microphone for rob um so that he can you can hear his buttery buttery voice in higher quality like <laughs> on our occasional episode where we record face to face yeah I, I hope people enjoyed that and um, please give us feedback on our um special episodes we'd like to know what you think about these so that we can plan for next year's silly season um as well uh we will be going back quite shortly to um normal stuff so we've got one more silly season episode and then i think everyone's back from the recess is that correct yeah that's right they're, they're just starting to get back now you can feel the, the political world is bubbling up a little bit more um, but we'll go into more detail yeah and you can join us for our next episode next silly season special will be on voting systems and elections uh, i think we both have some some opinions on that and we'll discuss at length the various types of things we've, we've mentioned first past the post a few times we're going to go into more depth on how those different systems work and what systems we think uh, should be used instead essentially and i think yeah it's time for us to go now so it's good night from me And it's a good night from him. Bye. 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 Oh, I've never heard that. That was, that's new. (laughs) That is new. I assume our poor listener got that as well, but that's really obvious. (laughs) I I never Um, knew Craig had a soul before. Now I'm scared. Um, (laughs) No, yeah, Craig, Craig, Craig is alive. Craig has taken over. Um,